Some of us are outwardly successful, but inwardly feel unhappy and living a life lacking in purpose and meaning. The Necktie and the Jaguar by Carl Greer can help you discover what's important to you and how to go for it. For more information or to purchase the book, visit carlgreer.com. That's C-A-R-L-G-R-E-E-R.com. Welcome to What is Going Om for new thought from the edge of Om. Each week on Om Time's flagship radio show, veteran broadcaster, author, and media consultant Sandy Sedgebeer conducts thought provoking interviews with inspirational authors, artists, musicians, scientists, speakers, and filmmakers who are working at the point where spirituality and science meet consciousness at the very edge of Om. Here is your host, Sandy Sedgebeer. Hello. Today's guest has been described by the ABC News Nightline program as one of the most sought-after psychics you've never heard of. I'm not sure exactly when that statement was made, but it's clear that with nine best-selling books to his credit, three of which appeared on Forbes magazine's list of 23 life-changing books, he is not only far from being unknown, but is widely considered to be one of the foremost spiritual channels working today. Paul Selig is a psychic medium and an award-winning author of transformational channeled literature, which includes the books I Am the Word, The Book of Mastery, and the Beyond the Known trilogy, in which he's recorded an extraordinary program for personal and planetary evolution as humankind awakens to its own divine nature. A noted academic, playwright and educator who served on the faculty of NYU for over 25 years and former director of the MFA in Creative Writing Programme at Goddard College, Paul Selick's work has been featured on ABC News Nightline, Fox News, the biography channels The Unexplained and Guy MTV's Beyond Belief. Paul Selick joins me now to talk about his latest book, The Kingdom which is the third and final volume in his Beyond the Known trilogy. Paul Selig, welcome. Thanks for having me. So, nine books in the 11 years, that's quite a feat. And the latest, mm-hmm. The Kingdom, was channeled and produced during COVID. Did the mm-hmm. restrictions uh, and the chaos of the pandemic make it easier for you to channel and produce the book or more challenging? Well, the books are done live. You know, uh, they're all spoken into being. There's really no writing involved. And I think the the five books prior to that were all, maybe more, were dictated in front of live audiences on the road. You know, some in live streams, but primarily they were dictated, you know, before students in workshops, um, you know, around the country and around the world. So with COVID, I couldn't travel. I um, actually was rerouted. I was doing a retreat in Costa Rica where New York City, where I had lived, was shut down, was in lockdown, and I ended up on Maui. And I ended up convening a small group that met online in a Zoom room, and I dictated the majority of the book to them, and some of the other parts of the book were dictated during, you know, live live streams with, you know, hundreds and hundreds of students online. Um, So it wasn't that it was harder, it was just different. And it was different, once again, to be speaking a book into being pretty much every day, um, which is how that worked. We met almost every day, and the guides would deliver a lecture or two for the book. and, um, And then the book was done in a very short amount of time. So as a playwright and director of Creative Writing Program, do you not feel that you oh, you just want to get in there and tweak things a little bit? Well, I can't. I mean, that's the deal with this stuff. You know, my name appears on the cover, but I'm not the author. And the agreement that was made with my first editor and publisher was that nothing would be changed. And I think in any of the books, maybe three words or so, or changed because I either mispronounced them or I added an S to a word that shouldn't have been pluralized because I was speaking so fast. Uh, Fortunately, you know, I whisper the words and then repeat them, and we can always get the right word, you know, by listening closely if there's a discrepancy. But the books are unedited. I mean, this is what comes out of my mouth. I feel that if it 
were edited, it wouldn't be a channeled book. It would be, you know, a book that was fixed up, you know, and mm. made palpable. And it's not my book to do that with. And that's how it stands. I think occasionally, you know, some of the sentence structures are awkward and long and you know would i want to go back and and clean it up then it wouldn't be the guide's book you know and yeah. i think given the fact that these books are spoken they're they're kind of amazingly readable when you think that there was no writing involved and somebody just closed their eyes and talked these whole things through in front of people um they hold up quite well mm. So the first two books in the Beyond the Known series urged readers to step beyond their own understanding and enter into the transformational work. Tell us what the third and final book in this trilogy, The Kingdom, offers to the reader. Well, The Kingdom is about sort of relocating consciousness to what they call the upper room, which they say is a, a level of vibration or tone that exists parallel to the one that we're operating in in our daily lives. So the guides say, you know, you can sing any song in, in multiple octaves. And what they're doing with us really through this trilogy is transposing the music that we are, the tone or vibration that we hold to play in a higher way. The kingdom is about the realization of the inherent divine in all things and all matter. And um, that's really where they're taking the reader, really, towards embodiment you know, at a different level of consciousness than we've been sort of known that we had access to. So how does one get there? I mean, what does one have to do? The guides work <clears throat> with attunements, um, which they've done from the very beginning, since the very first book, I Am the Word, and which was dictated in 2009. And before that, in the groups that, you know, I would facilitate in my apartment, I was an academic, but I was channeling in my apartment once a week for about 18 years, you know, in front of a small group. So the attunements, they say, are language that's encoded with vibration and the invocation of the attunements, which are usually physically quite palpable for people when they work with them, are really here to support us in operating at a higher level of vibration or consciousness. For years, the guides used to say it was about being, and the teachings were about being in accord, and they'd say A-C-C-O-R-D or A-C-H-O-R-D is on a piano. And I got it sort of metaphorically, but I didn't understand that what they were talking about was really quite literal. And they talk about the attunements, the varying attunements, as notes being played on a piano. And when the notes are played in simultaneity in, 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 in one invocation, when they're all sort of aligned to, that is the chord of resonance that allows the consciousness to, to really shift. So they say it's an incremental process, and I, I suspect, if I'm right, that, you know, in all of the books they're taking us towards a, a sense of integration and, and completion, you know, with this teaching. But this is what they do. It's really the entirety of the teaching is this level of, of transposition. The individual claims of truth, you can be working with personally or in a group. When I would do workshops, we'd work with them all. And you can feel the energy of them, and you can send the energy, and your partner can feel it when it's sent. And so once all of these things are played out, you move to a much larger recognition in, in the kingdom. The claim is God is, God is, God is. The guides that I work with say that the only real problem humanity faces now is what they call the denial of the divine, you know, which is basically an alignment to fear. And they say, you know, you can't make anything holy. It already is holy, but you can deny the divine in whatever you want and whatever you see. And the level of reality that we've been reared in, grown accustomed to, or and consequently are in co-resonance with is, is pretty much, I would suggest, imbued with fear. You know, it was here when we got here and we expect it. And the upper room, which is what the guides teach, is this other level of consciousness, which is the entryway to, to the kingdom. And the kingdom they define as the awareness of the inherent divine in all things. Um, you know, the upper room is, is a place that does not express fear. Fear doesn't land there. Mm -hmm. So when you move there in vibration, suddenly your choices are different because you're not operating out of the old inherited paradigm. Mm. 
The guides talk a lot about the true self. Um, many mm -hmm. people think, yeah. you know, what does that mean? I, you know, I yeah. know who I am. Um, mm -hmm. Explain what they mean by the true self. My understanding of the true self is that it's the personality construct. Really, that's it. And the personality construct is sort of born in agreement to what it has learned. You know, it's it, it doesn't really comprehend the new it knows what it's known or it knows everything through the lens of history the true self they suggest i think is the divine self or the monad which is the the light within or you can call it sometimes they call it the christ they often call it the monad but they say there's a name for it in every religion but it's not a religious term so the realization of the monad or sort of this encounter with the inherent divine that they say is seeking to realize itself through us is the true self. Now, the personality structure still has a place. It gets assumed by the higher. You know, we just sort of think that who we are is the personality, whereas that's kind of like the sweater that we wear that we mistake for, you know, the who that we are. When I was quite young, when I was in my early 30s and I was struggling, I heard something in channel, which was when I was just really first opening up to here, and I, I'm 99% sure I, I, I heard it in channel because I wrote it down and left it in a book, but I heard freedom will come when the throne relinquishes its king, and I just didn't understand it. But I understand it now because it's sort of the essence of the teaching, which is who sits in the throne, who's ruling, what level of consciousness is ruling the reality that we attend to. And if it's my personality self, the small self, I want what I want when I want it. I'm going to do the best I can. But I really don't see past this idea of self that has actually been born in separation and separation to the source of all things. The divine self or the true self, they say, knows itself in tandem or in consort with whatever you want to call God you know, source, energy, whatever that may be. The true self knows, they say, and the small self thinks. And there's nothing wrong with thinking, and the small self has a place. We've just mistaken it for who and what we truly are. And in fact, they say we're infinitely greater than that. What, one thing that no one has ever been able to help me understand is that mm -hmm. if we are all sparks part of the divine, if our true selves know unity in its fullest expression, why would we want to come here and experience separation and division? Well, I think what I understand about this is that we did this. We created the separation. This is what we chose. You know, we did it. And we did it through the inherent denial of the divine, you know, which was a belief that our needs weren't going to be met and that there wouldn't be enough. And if I don't get it from my neighbor, I'm never going to get it at all. So I can, you know, do what I have to to get my needs met. So all of those things are born in separation. The guides I work with say, you know, this is opportunity still. It's school still, but there are other ways to learn. And I do believe that the soul progresses. This is something that they've talked about somewhat in the books. But that the soul is in progression. The divine self or the monad is speaking to itself only in the present moment because it knows itself in the present moment. God is all things but operates beyond time, you know. So when we begin to move to that place, you're talking about the illumination of the soul and the, I would say, the the aligning of the personality structure in a higher way. I don't know that it's the death of the ego or the personality self as much as it is perhaps a restructuring and putting no longer putting the cart before the horse. But my understanding is we did it, we chose it, nobody did it to us. It's not some sort of idea of a punishing God that says, okay, now you're all on your own and go screw yourselves and maybe figure it out if you can. It's basically we created the obstruction. And because it's our creation, our decision to war, our decision to operate in fear and division, because we've chosen that, we get to move beyond that. That's our, that's our call. And the guides I work with are, I hope, helping us to do that. I mean, that's what it certainly appears like. So uh, that makes sense to me. I mean, it's never made sense that, you know, 
we, we need to be in school because if we are, if we have the divine within us, we don't need school. But what you've said that we chose it is a whole other thing, which also means that we can unchoose it. We can choose yeah. something else. Yeah. Exactly. Some some of your guides have said that they have been um, incarnated and some have mm -hmm. not. Mm -hmm. So presumably the ones that have been incarnated have reached a place where they have been able to choose differently. I expect so. You know, it's not in from, you know, truthfully, it's not stuff I've asked about a lot. You know, when it comes through and when they talk about themselves, I'm always a little bit tad and, and you know, uncomfortable. I've had, there's one guy that I've seen, you know, in meditation and under hypnosis that's, that I recognize well, and he's very particular in how he appears and, I'm very grateful that I've had those experiences. <clears throat> Others, uh, you know, I, I'm primarily a clairaudient. I'm primarily hearing and clairsentient. I'm primarily feeling. When I get visual information, I'm always interested because that's not the first thing that really began appearing for me in my work. It came a bit later. So the ones that I think were here reference when I hear them speak a level of agreement to the material plane that I don't necessarily hear from all of them. When I was dictating the newest book, which is will be the tenth book, which will be out next year, there was a guy that came through in a lecture that was working with metaphors of the household. It felt female to me in an interesting way. But the metaphors that were the illustrations that were being used, which was embroidery and cooking and how you know, how like a bodice is beaded and then when the fabric is stretched, the beads fall away. It was like, well, whoever is talking about this, you know, knew how to sew. You know, they did. I don't know how to sew. You know, it would never <laughs> occur to me to use those metaphors. I can't even cook. So, you know, when I hear those things, I'm grounded in a way. I have other guides. I, mean, I was saying this to somebody the other day, you know, I think the guides have used the word computer once or twice in 10 years. Mostly if I say, like, am I going to hear from Joe? And then I hear on the TV, that means on the computer. They call the computer a television, you know, because it's got a screen, I suppose. So their language is their language. It's slightly different from mine, which is part of the reason I can, I can, I know when I'm channeling, you know, I don't use the term fellow, like me and my, my, I will be going with my fellows to the tavern is nothing that would ever come out of my mouth, but that's how they talk. And I go, okay, well, here we go again. Mm. Well, I'm not surprised really by, you know, the household um, uh, metaphors, because I mean, when they talk about, um, you know, the, the upper the doorway and the upper mm -hmm. upper room and the basement, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. there's the house right there. Yeah, it is. It is. You know, the upper room came, uh, you know, it's really funny. I, it was the end of the um, the second trilogy. And I think it was, um, I think it was the Book of Freedom, I think was that final book. And, you know, at the end of that book, they invited all of the, re I was channeling at the Esalen Institute in California when that was being dictated. And they said, you know, they invited all the students to, to come across a threshold. And like there was all this joy, you know, you know, prepare for your new lives. Here it is, come across the threshold. And I thought, what that was a lovely ending for a book, but I didn't know what the hell they were talking about. And then the very next book, which was also begun at the Esalen Institute, they began the very first class up on the other side of the threshold in what they call the upper room. And that's where this entire trilogy was sort of grounded in, this teaching of what they call the upper room. And I think the teachings prior to that are really in some ways preparatory and necessary. Um, what they had said to me at one point, you know, when I was sitting in a session with somebody who was asking the guides questions for me, I was like, well, when's Paul going to get this stuff? And, you know, the answer that they gave was, well, you know, Paul's job is to hold the door open for others. And at the time, I thought, well, that really stinks. You know, that's not what I thought that I was doing here. But then at the end of Book of Freedom, when they invited everybody to cross the doorway, they said, you know, and Paul, you get to come too. And that's when I realized perhaps that the doorway were the books, 
you know, the books are a doorway yes. for people to enter. And my mm -hmm. job was to hold the space for the books, and that I'm happy to do. When you channeled the first book, um, did you have any idea there were going to be this many more to come? No. I didn't believe there was going to be a first book. You know, I had gotten, you know, canned from a job. I went to bed for three days. A colleague of mine from academia called me and said, you know, Paul, maybe this would be a good time to write that memoir about how you became clear audience. And I never intended to write anything again as long as I lived. And I said no, and the guides piped in and said, well, we have a book to write, and if you take two weeks, we'll do it. And we made an appointment two days later, and they dictated this book called I Am the Word over the... It was two and a half weeks, because I took two days off to go teach. Um, and that was the beginning. And then I knew that it was a trilogy early on, but that was it. Um, and every time they finished a book, I thought, well, there's nothing else for them to teach. We must be done. And then there's more. Um, so I've sort of given up on limiting them. Um, I think when the first book was dictated, I just didn't care. You know, I just had my ego quashed. I had time on my hands that I hadn't expected to have. And, um, and I didn't care what people thought. So I sat down and I took the dictation. It's funny, you know, I didn't have a beard when the first book started, and I had a beard by the end of the two weeks, and I've had the beard ever since. It's, and I just didn't shave, you know. So I look at it as a real marker in my life when these books begin to come, because they're, they've come quickly, but they don't take that long to dictate. You know, the first book was two and a half weeks. Most of the books now are a couple of months, because I don't channel every day. This last book I channeled every day, I think it was about five weeks maybe total four or five weeks of dictation sessions because I worked most days. But the first books I did would sit for an hour or two hours at a time. And I would, be, I would barely be able to get out of a chair after that. I'd be staggering around the room. Mm. You know, in retrospect, I don't know how I... Because the book channelings are far more intense than just doing a workshop. There's something so exacting about how they work with language. And the level of vibration isn't just to dictate the words it's what's going to inform the entire text and it's what the reader feels when the reader is working with the book so they're 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 just amped up in a, in a in a very specific way that i experience do you when you are channeling the books do you feel the frequency the vibration coming through you and do you remember what you've said i do feel the energy um, I'm used to it, so if it's really strong or they're doing something different with it, I'm aware of that. I prefer to work in workshops with people in the room because then you can feel all the energy shifting and you can feel the attunements when they're invoked and how, you know, the whole room shifts and everybody can feel it's exciting. People that mm -hmm. have never felt energy before can feel this stuff. So I like that, but when I'm channeling online, yeah, I still feel the shifts. I remember about a third of what comes through me. I mean, if you ask me what I channeled last Wednesday, because I do a, an every Wednesday group online, I wouldn't be able to tell you, you know. I, I really don't. I mean, it's like in one ear, out the other. Um, at the time, I... I, I think like right after the fact, I might say, well, that was really interesting, or that thing they said about such and such was interesting, but mostly it's gone. I mean, I say that, you know, when I'm channeling, I, I do a little prayer protection before I start that I've done for since the very beginning, and it just sort of sets the tone for me. But I imagine myself often climbing into the back seat of a car, you know, while that's happening and turning the steering wheel over to the guide. So I'm half listening from the back seat unless I hear something that I find alarming or really confusing, and then I lean forward and they'll say, Paul is interrupting, and this is the question. <laughs> and then that's okay. Then they'll usually take it. Not always, but usually. Yes, and they seem to know what you're thinking too, don't they? Yeah, um, yeah. Quite often in the book they say, oh, Paul's think, you know, Paul wants to know this, yeah. even though you've not asked. Yeah. Well, I think they've learned how to preempt some of my interruptions by getting there first. 
there was one book where I was in. I was, the first couple of books were dictated over the phone. I mean, I was recording in my apartment in New York, but there was also somebody taking notes in the phone. There has to be an active listener. Now there can be hundreds of people present for a book dictation. But I, there was one session, it was maybe the first one, where the person who was usually on the phone was in the room with me, and her sneakers squeaked on the floor, and I jumped out of my skin, and I thought, that's it, I can't channel, there's too much noise. And the guides actually had to like talk me down from the roof, and they said, we're, we're going to continue, um, and we'll decide at the end of this chapter whether it remains in the book. And in fact, it did remain in the book, but they did a whole chapter on my fear basically, or a whole lecture on my fear, which I don't think was anticipated. Since then, they've learned to sort of step in and inform a little bit to keep things, I think, on track. But I can still interrupt if I, if, if, if I am confused, and I do. You know, I just, I'm going to, because that's where I feel a little bit responsible. If they were to say the moon is made of green cheese, I'd have to say, hey, wait a minute. You know, I don't want, I, I can't be party to this, and then they're going to explain what they meant. Well, I would imagine that your fear on that occasion also gave them a wonderful opportunity to talk about fear because this is such yeah, a big, it did. It's, big yeah, subject. Yeah, it does. It always does. Yeah. I mean, well, they talk about fear a lot and they talk about my fear. Often enough, I think one of the only ways they can get real good messages through to me is when I'm channeling publicly because I can't, the deal is I can't shut up and interrupt. And if I'm doing the dishes and I hear, I, I mean, I don't like to read for myself. I don't do it often. I get advice or support, I really get advice. I get information in the moment about the moment, not long term. And the guides are pretty big about my not making choices based in fear. So I'll get support with that. But mostly I'm not, you know, going to listen to them if I'm doing the dishes. So if they want to get something important across to me they'll often take the advantage of a class take advantage of a class and say and we have something to say to paul you know <laughs> and, um, and i'll go okay here we go again and I'm, I'm usually not thrilled about it but it's usually something that is going to be helpful for me to know for for the future mm. we're going to take a short break now paul you're listening to What Is Going On. I'm Sandy Sedgbeer, and my guest today is psychic medium and award-winning author of transformational channeled literature Paul Selig, and we're talking about his latest book, The Kingdom, which is the final book in the Beyond the Known trilogy. We'll be back with more from Paul Selig after this break. The future of internet radio is here. Ohm Times Radio, IOM FM. Being a radio host on IOM FM allows you to build your show on a rich platform with the power of the Internet to fulfill your outreach goals and connect with a very specialized and global online audience, unlimited by time and distance. Ohm Times Radio will provide you with web relevance, a recognizable conscious brand, and with the standard of excellence that has accompanied every single Ohm Times endeavor. Host your show with Ohm Times Radio Network. Vox Novus, the new voice. Vox Novus, the new dimension. Vox Novus, thought and movement leaders who will share from their experience and offer tools to help us navigate our rapidly changing world. My name is Victor Furman. Join me every Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern on Own Times Radio for Vox Novus, the new voice mental health. Most people think it means mental illness. Most people are wrong. Mental health doesn't apply to just some of us. It applies to everyone. We're all susceptible to anxiety and depression. They're human conditions. And no person should ever feel embarrassed, ashamed, or be discriminated against for being human. Cracked the Podcast strips away the shame, fear, and stigma by expanding the conversation into areas less often visited. From brain and body chemistry, hormones, food, nutrition, trauma, and the microbiome, to pharmaceutical drugs, psychedelic substances, meditation, visionary experiences, and spiritual awakenings. Cracked the Podcast will explore them all, including the notion that, for many, Breakdown can be the beginning of breakthrough. For in the words of singer-songwriter Leonard Cohen, there is a crack in everything. It's where the light gets in. Cracked the podcast, slaying the dragons of mental health. 
Join co-hosts Sandy Sedgebeer and Rebecca Shaper on the first and third Thursday of every month at 12 noon Eastern Time. Coping 19, brought to you by CDC and the Ad Council. If you're feeling increasingly lonely right now, you're not alone. It's totally normal. Even though we may not be able to get together in person, connecting virtually with friends and family still gives you a chance to interact with people and may help raise your spirits. Join a virtual book club, set up group text chats, or online video coffee breaks with coworkers. Find more self-care and coping tips at coping-19.org. Welcome back. Before we resume this week's conversation with Paul Selig, here's a suggestion for those of you who struggle with making important decisions. There's an, an inspiring book I'd invite you to check out called The Necktie and the Jaguar by retired clinical psychologist, Jungian analyst and shamanic practitioner Carl Greer. In addition to revealing how he tapped into the wisdom and power of unseen worlds, for guidance and inspiration, Carl's fascinating memoir offers some valuable keys and questions that inspire the kind of thinking that guides you effortlessly on your own path to transformation. Check it out for yourself at carlgreer.com. And now, back to Paul Selig. Paul, throughout the years, there have been many books written by people from diverse cultures and spiritual lineages that have endeavoured to help us understand and reconnect with who we truly are. Now, as we are moving through this massive planetary transition that's systematically dismantling every structure and system that generations have lived by and moving us into a place as yet unknown, do you look back over the past 10, 11 years and feel that your work has been perfectly timed to prepare and guide people beyond the known? Yeah, I do. And I, it's funny because I wouldn't have said that necessarily three years ago. I was just busy taking the dictation. Um, the very first book, I Am the Word, the guides talked about you know this being a time of reckoning, and they would describe a reckoning as a facing of oneself and all of one's creations. And they say that everything that really has been established um, or infused by fear would need to be renown in a higher way. And then in the subsequent books, they began to talk about uh, sort of the re-knowing of structures, economic structures, political structures, you know, religious structures, I mean, all this stuff, you know. And the Book of Truth, which was dictated oh, maybe five, six years ago now, the guide say what's about that, the guide said that what was about to happen was that everything that had been hidden was going to be revealed and it would be like living in an archaeological dig for a time, you know, and it looks like a mess, but really things are just being brought forward to be reseen or brought to the light. It's not about making everything wrong and, you know, being frightened or punishing. It's about seeing what we've been party to, you know, in one way or another, so that it can be reseen or renown in a higher way. So it's funny, when I was um, channeling, I was a live stream, I think. It was maybe, you know, two, two years ago, two and a half years ago. And the guides said, you know, get ready. Basically, the crap is going to hit the fan, and you all need to be prepared, and blah, 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 blah. And I don't get fear-based messages, and this wasn't a fear-based message. But, and I heard, you know, in New York is going to be affected. And I just said, please, God, don't let me be in New York again for another mess. You know, I was there for 9-11. I was there through the whole AIDS epidemic. I just was like, I, I, you know, three blackouts, you know. It's like, I just, I said, please, God, just let me be someplace pretty, you know. And I, and I actually was. And I ended up moving to Maui, which was completely unexpected during this whole thing. So I find that they've been quite prescient, and everything that I'm hearing is quite positive about where we're headed. We have choice, but the guides I work with have said that humanity has decided, you know, at a collective level in a sort of a causal field that we're going to move through this. And they talk about it, as they've talked about it for 10 years, this being a great wave of change, and that the purpose of the change is to bring us to a higher shore, a higher way of being, and, you know, how we attend to this change is really up to us. You know, we can 
We can do it kicking and screaming, or we can allow ourselves to be carried in a higher way. And I, I hope that that's the truth. It's actually been my experience thus far, um, and I've been surprised by that. But um, but I've, I've found these times to be deeply challenging and also deeply remarkable. Mm, absolutely. Um, you know, as they're talking about the dismantling of the of the civilization being before us now, they also say that the challenge we face with where they're taking us now is that we cannot conceive of it through the practical yeah. lens of prior association. Say yeah, more about yeah. that. Well, I mean, I don't understand it yet. I know what they say, and that you know we don't have a context for what we have yet to experience. And so what we want to do is name everything or label everything as best we can through our prior relationships. The guides have said, you know, they don't use the language of science because I used to think it's just because I failed science and I don't know what anything is, but they said it's because the language of science is going to be outdated in 100 years again and again and again. And they tend to use music and, you know, descriptions of sound and vibration in its place. So <clears throat> my understanding thus far is that we're moving to a level of consciousness where we're no longer operating through the lens of fear and separation. But I also get that this is something that takes a few generations to occur. I don't know that one day we're going to wake up in nirvana. I'd be shocked. Maybe that happens at an individual level, but the guides are speaking of humanity as a whole and a transition that we're making to another level of being. And, uh, you know, everything that I hear feels incredibly hopeful. It doesn't always feel possible to me at a level of monkey mind because I don't have reference for it. But, you know, even they say, you know, our ideas of source or God or whatever you want to call it are still so fraud or codified by the things that we've been taught it to be, you know, an old man on a cloud or an impartial energy or anything, you know, it's a way of understanding it. And they say you can't understand the vastness of God, but, you know, you can have an experience of it. They say you'll never understand the entirety of the ocean, but the moment you bathe in the ocean, you know the ocean. You know it, you've had an experience of it. And that seems to be where they're taking us at an experiential level. I know that in my own case, you know, my practice as a psychic is primarily telepathic. I tune into people, mostly the living. So if you're estranged from your sister, I can tune into your sister. I might start to resemble her. And I can hear her, and I can broker a conversation at a higher level. <clears throat> and it's interesting. I've been filmed doing this with people that I've never met and sort of taking on their mannerisms. But this is something that would have been completely impossible for me, given who I was and kind of how I was raised. I was raised pretty much an atheist. Um, and I was, you know, I'm still not very woo-woo. I'm not a good new ager. I want practical <laughs> experience that I can yeah. know. I'm with you. I don't, want it, I don't want somebody waving a crystal wand over my head and telling me I'm fixed. Yeah. It doesn't work. So no. that's all I know about this. Well, it's interesting that there's a quote from your first book, I Am the Word, that actually mm -hmm. presaged this because they said, we are the first in a generation of conscious yeah. beings coming into form and we will make it possible for those that follow to exist yeah. more easily in the higher frequencies. Yeah. That's what they said. And I was doing a public live stream maybe two months ago and there were, there were like thousands of people on this thing. And the guide said, I don't know, somebody must have asked a question, or maybe it was in the lecture, and they said it's going to take, you know, I don't know where they said three or four generations for this to be realized. And, of course, people got terribly upset. It's like, well, how dare they make us wait? <laughs> it's like, that's not a lot of time if you think about the level of change. I mean, what they've said is, you know, we've lived with war for so long that we expect, we expect it. We expect war, and consequently we will always have it, and we've created the means for self-destruction. And they say, if you think the bombs that we've created are not going to go off, you're crazy. They're meant to go off. I mean, the idea that we can build a bomb to preserve peace, they think, is lunacy. But they've said, you know, that um, 
what was I about to say? Oh, yeah, until we move to a level of consciousness where war is not an option, we'll have it. And I think that's where they're taking us. But that's consciousness, do you know? If it's not, if you still feel that you need to steal to get your needs met or hoard to be safe, you're going to do those things until you move to a level of consciousness where those things aren't required. Probably you'll act out on them. And, you know, this idea of, of source as supply, which is an old you know, nothing new there, you know, it's a metaphysical truth. It's a larger thing that they're teaching. I think we've gone through a period in spiritual culture where perhaps God was looked at as a catalog that people got to order from. It was all about sort of how can I get this or manifest that. And I think that there's a whole other way of beginning to comprehend this, which is that we can be in recipient of our good in our needs and be proactive on their behalf but in a very different way perhaps than we thought you know and i think when those shifts begin to happen a lot of other things get to change because then we're operating more from a basis of faith and not fear but they also say that this is not the first time that humanity has reconciled yeah. to be lifted and it won't be the last so why if if we reach that place where we, you know, move into the unknown and it is more than we can possibly imagine and there is no fear, why do we keep needing to be lifted? I don't know. I mean, it's a, I mean, I remember that phrase in the book and I was sort of confounded by it. You know, people have talked about cultures that have ascended, you know, individual cultures that have, have, have moved beyond this sort of dimensional reality and you know that's not that's not my stuff i don't know about that stuff i'm actually not a scholar with any of this um so i'm gonna i'm gonna ask them and see if i get anything but i i wasn't expecting to channel i'm on my second cup of coffee it's early here in hawaii so let me just see if i can hear anything we would like they're saying we would like to answer this humanity has chosen at different times at different times to release a sense of self to release a sense of self that was independent that was independent structurally structurally from the source of all things from the source of all things each time humanity has done this each time humanity has done this it's created a new paradigm it's created a new paradigm or a new potential or a new potential that can and will be realized in form that can and will be realized in form in history in history there have been times there have been times where systems themselves where systems themselves were fully integrated in source were fully integrated in source or simply the idea of form or simply the idea of form as you comprehend form as you comprehend form we're actually known in totality we're actually known in totality of the energy of God of the energy of God when something is known as of God when something is known as of God it has a different tone or field it has a different tone or field and a different way of operating and a different way of operating there are actually realities there are actually realities that were initially established on this plane that were initially established on this plane that actually operate now independently from it that actually operate now independently from it because of the collective agreement to ascend because of the collective agreement to ascend this would not make sense to you practically this would not make sense to you practically but if you understand the time itself but if you understand the time itself is something you observe is something that you observe decide what is decide what is and make claims with and for and make claims with and for you will also understand you will also understand that what appears to be present time that what appears to be present time holds multiple realities within it holds multiple realities within it these realities are slipping with you these realities are living with you are living with you concurrently concurrently parallel if you wish, parallel if you wish, or aligned in higher strata. Or aligned in higher strata. Humanity chooses at different times. Humanity chooses at different times to renew itself beyond a creation, to renew itself beyond a creation. The version of reality you exist in, the version of reality that you are existing in, in the present tense version. And please understand it is a version, not the only reality there is to know yourself in, and not the only reality there is to know the self in. It's about to be manifested. It's about to be manifested in a much higher tone than it's held, in a much higher tone than it is held, which means the dismantling of the old, which 
means the dismantling of the old or that which cannot align to the higher or that which cannot align to the higher. And this will happen again and again. And this will happen again and again in any evolution, in any evolution. Underline the word any. Underline the word any. You are not the only thing ascending on this plane. You are not the only thing ascending on this plane. In fact, all matter is ascending. In fact, all matter is ascending because all holds conscious. Because all holds consciousness, period. And they just said period. Hmm. Um, yeah, I can understand that. I remember another channel telling me once that, you know, we really don't understand time. And yes, people are beginning to get the, you know, multiple dimensions. But uh, this person said that, you know, time, it's like there's many stratas of it and it is constantly overlapping. It's like mm -hmm. waves of overlapping. So I can see why. That's interesting, yeah. Yeah, why we might think, well, you know, why have we gone backwards? <laughs> Mm -hmm. We're just in another, uh, I imagine, another lap of that time. So what do they say then about the future of humanity? Presumably then we're going to choose to to do this. We're going to choose yeah, to Yeah, what I hear. I don't know that it's necessarily going to be pretty <laughs> along the way. <laughs> you know, I really, you know, it's not comfortable. We don't want to change. We'd rather hold on to the old misery than and perhaps find ourselves beyond, you know, a way of being that we've always been. And, um, but I, I feel always, you know, that it's hopeful. Um, I don't, when they've been teaching, you know, for the last couple of years, they've used a lot of metaphors about waves and ocean crossings and rough crossings and being washed up on a new shore. <coughs> Pardon me. And recently... They're back to these great big wave metaphors where everything is being carried in the waves. And we're trying to, you know, hold on desperately to like, you know, the bedside lamp, you know, because at least we know what it is. And in fact, you know, we're holding on to what we've known ourselves through. And I suspect that that stuff gets to be changed. I don't know what it's going to look like yet. I haven't heard. I do know, though, and this is odd that I'm living a radically different life now than I used to. And it's come from letting go of my ideas of who I should be and where I should be and how I should be living. That doesn't mean that I've ascended or enlightened. I'm not. You know, I'm this guy showing up. But I am now understanding the benefit of letting go in a way that I never have. Mm -hmm. I think this is one of the gifts of the pandemic. Many people... Yeah. by letting go of the way they always did things. <laughs> yeah, and I wouldn't, I mean, I don't think any one of us would have chosen it, you know. No. I, no. Mean, I wouldn't have, you know, I could literally could not go home, and that's how everything changed. And, you know, I used to do these workshops, and the guides would say to people at the end, you know, you don't have to go home. You, 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 you're going to choose to, but you don't have to, you know, if you have the means you never have to go home again, really. I mean, you know, basically, if you have a credit card, you can just go wherever you mm -hmm. want to. You know, you don't have to go back to what you knew. And I would think, well, that's nice of them to say that. I understand it. I never did. I never went back to my apartment. My dog got sent to me. My things got packed up and sent later. You know, I never went back. It was the craziest thing in the world. And I will go back, but not to to what I had, I will go back yeah. with a very new consciousness. Absolutely. One of the things that they um, talk about, they were talking about if we decide to discriminate against our brother, to deny our sister mm -hmm. food or shelter, etc., we will deliver ourselves, um, I think they said, to a must that we will not enjoy. Um, but the moment we say, I am in union with source, we move into the alignment of the upper mm -hmm. room and claim the kingdom. Is it really as simple as saying, I am in union with source? I mean, surely there's a I lot more I than that. I suspect it is, but it depends on the who or the aspect of self that's saying that. I could say I'm on the planet Mars right now, and perhaps there's an aspect of my consciousness that can go there and visit, but that's not my experience of myself at all, and it would be a false statement. The guides say there's an aspect in all of us that already exists in what they call the upper room that's already in union. 
Their entire mm. teaching seems to be to align us to that part of ourselves where we're already operating there. So when they teach, and they teach the upper room, there are a few attunements that precede it, but they claim, I am in the upper room. People, you just have to say it, and people feel you can feel the energetic shift. And then, you know, they'll say, what do, you, what do you notice here? And what people notice is there's no fear. They're not operating at that level there. Now we can go right back down to the fear if we want to, and I do it all the time, because I still believe that the fear is useful and helpful, even though I don't, I'm getting the message that it's not. That God say fear is a great liar, you know, and they make a big distinction between fear and prudence, and prudence they're in support of. If it's raining, have an umbrella as prudence. You, know? yeah. you don't have to be frightened yeah. of the rain. So I don't know. That's my my sense of it. But yes, I think it is easier. You know, the simple claim they work with, God is, God is, God is, which they say refutes the denial of the divine. Again, if it's spoken from the aspect of you that knows truth, um, because the guides say in all of their attunements, what is true is always true. You're not making it up. You're actually claiming what is always true that has been denied. That's why you can align to it, but you can feel the shifts when you work with it. Well, I've always maintained that, you know, we know truth. I mean, we recognize mm -hmm. truth. There's something yeah. within us that is attuned to truth, and we feel it. Yeah. Yeah. So this is the final book in the third trilogy. Um, mm -hmm. Is it significant that all your books seem to come in trilogies, that they have three parts? I have no idea. I really don't. Um, I really don't. Um, it's funny that you ask that. Um, I, I mean, I suspect the guides would, you know, would say if I said, well, the publisher would like us to do this in quadruplets or whatever, they might just show up. But I really don't know. I think that they parse the teachings out in ways that are very specific. I also don't think they care at a certain level. You know, it's like if I'm mm -hmm. going to channel at a workshop and I know that I've got two hours, they show up at the time and they deliver. I don't prepare anything. I mean, I hope that my clothes are clean and that the mic works and that I've got a, a nice coffee by my side, which is what I like to have next to me when I work. But that's it. And then they do the work. So they work within the structures that we have here, you know, and they're, they're, they're aware of how long I can work. And they're much better about that, I think, than they were at the beginning. Like, they'll usually stop me at half an hour. Sometimes I'll go to 40 minutes because it's too taxing, and then I can, you know, take 10 minutes and come back and, and reboot. So I, I don't know, but I know there's another trilogy. I've agreed to it, you know, and they've okay. already delivered the first book, yeah. Can you tell us anything about that book? It's called Resurrection. Um, I think it's different from the other books. I was kind of fascinated by it when it was happening. It was done really fast, and the guide said it was done really fast because that was the best way to override my resistance. So it was done in a live workshop a little. I convened a group of, of, of senior students for a little retreat here on, on Maui, and everything else was done online or in this group of a group of like seven people that were there for the kingdom, for the dictation, came back and were there for this book. It's called Resurrection. Uh, it's about embodiment. That's the best way I can explain it, but it's way out there. I mean, I was sort of dropping my jaw about some of the things that they were starting to address. But, I, you know, fortunately, I don't remember most of it. <laughs> when I get the copy edited version back from the publisher, I'll have to sit down and really read it, which is often when I really read the books, you know. At the time, and I, are you I, I are you surprised it. when you read them? I, what, yeah, I'm surprised that they're readable. I'm surprised that they're so coherent. You know, and whenever I used to sort of question this stuff, you know, I was I, I find out you know I don't care how eloquent I may be. I don't think I'm capable of closing my eyes and dictating nine books that don't require any editing in front of people. You know, I just think it's nuts. But I find that fascinating about it, and they're wonderfully responsible at that level. I mean, if I were to show up and nothing were to happen, I don't know that I would ever be able to do it again. I'd be too worried. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm always surprised by this. 
Paul Selig, thank you for joining us today. Um, thank you for sitting there in that chair and doing what you do. Um, it's making a difference to so many people. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Oh, you're welcome. The Kingdom, a channeled text, book three in the Beyond the Known trilogy by Paul Selig is published by St. Martin's Essentials. And Paul offers channeled workshops internationally and conducts frequent live stream seminars. And you can find out more about these at his website at paulselig.com. For more information about the No BS Spiritual Book Club and our live stream and interviews with contributors, visit sedgebeer.com, click on the No BS Spiritual Book Club tab, where you can sign up to be the first to see the latest 10 best lists and who's being interviewed next. And if you know you have a book in you but don't know where to start, click on the Work With Me tab and find out how my experience helping others tell their stories might be the catalyst you been looking for. I'll be back at the same time next week with another edition of What Is Going On. Till then, it's goodbye from me.